House of Leaves is considered by many readers, writers, and artists to be one of the highest achievements in postmodern literature and one of the most important creative works of the new millennium. The influence and impact generated by this book has inspired countless novels, movies, TV shows, art pieces, songs, games, web series, and alternate reality games. It is fair to say that a great number of creative works we appreciate and honor today would not exist or nearly resemble their form were it not for the publication of House of Leaves. To read the novel and experience the story and its effects unspoiled is a special rite in the art world, and this journey is held in sacred memory by those who have entered the house on Ash Tree Lane. This video experience is unauthorized, unofficial, and made without permission or knowledge of the parties involved in the publication and writing of House of Leaves, and it is in no way, shape, form, or intention any sort of substitute, affiliated work, direct adaptation, reproduction, or replacement for House of Leaves. This is, at the very best, one reader's own lengthy footnote, separate from the novel and all its official content. This video essay experience could never equal the work, art, and craftsmanship of Marxy Danileski, Johnny Truant, Zampano, and their editor. To go forward with viewing this video without first reading House of Leaves is an act of ultimate misunderstanding, disrespect, and the infliction of great misfortune, not merely in regard to its author, but to oneself. Do not deny yourself the opportunity. All the pictures you see here are from the first House of Leaves Challenge participants, who chose to face the house and complete its journey within nine days or less. It is highly advised that anyone who wishes to engage this video experience join their fellow house guests by obtaining a personal copy of House of Leaves. Links to retailers carrying the novel have been provided in the video description for ease. Alternatively, there is another institution older than the bookstore known as the library, where you might acquire a copy of House of Leaves for a temporary period, as long as someone else isn't currently in possession. Due to overwhelming support by viewers participating in the House of Leaves challenge, Pantheon Books are aware of our venture and are offering a trivia challenge of their own in celebration of House of Leaves and the love of fiction. Head over to at Pantheon Books on Instagram and answer a question concerning this video experience for the chance to win a free copy of one of Mark Z. Danielewski's novels. You'll also have the opportunity to partake in this challenge again following the release of House of Leaves, Explored Part 3. Many thanks to Pantheon for reaching out in the wake of the House of Leaves challenge with such kindness and support. This video essay experience will never equal replace, substitute, or pretend to be anything measuring the authentic House of Leaves. Read the book. If you enter the maze without doing so, I cannot help you find what you have lost. Whoever has no house now will never have one. While enthusiasts and detractors may continue to empty entire repertoires attempting to describe or deride it, meaning still remains the word most likely to stir a debate. In fact, this leading obsession, to validate or invalidate the footnotes and diaries therein, invariably brings up a collateral and more general concern. Whether or not, with the advent of postmodern literature, storytelling has forsaken its once unimpeachable form of conveying the meaning. For the most part, skeptics call the whole effort a performance, but grudgingly admit House of Leaves is a performance of exceptional quality. Unfortunately, out of those who accept its validity, many tend to swear allegiance to the enlightenment available through postmodern Dadaist humor and split-medium storytelling, primarily found in the place of the story's first telling. 
Clearly, it is not easy to appear credible when after vouching for a novel's verity, the discourse suddenly switches to matters of the preservation of internet viral fiction as legitimate artwork. One thing remains certain. Any controversy surrounding the validity of cryptic web-based sightings of monsters and ghosts has been supplanted by the haunting power of the house on Ash Tree Lane. Though many continue to devote substantial time and energy to the antinomies of fact or fiction, symbolism or subterfuge, art or prank, as of late the more interesting material dwells exclusively on the interpretation of events within the novel. Much like its content, House of Leaves itself is also uneasily contained, whether by genre or purpose. If finally cataloged as a horror tale, contemporary paranormal parable, or merely a story of disturbed youth in a hedonistic society, as some have called it, the novel will still, sooner or later, slip the limits of any one of those genres. This novel is never truly sad in its form. It is alive. It will never let you trust all of its twists and turns entirely, even with clues, guides, indexes, hints, and echoes belaying direction. Form follows function and its function is through its form. Since publication in the year 2000, all manner of readers, analysts, and mystery enthusiasts have explored House of Leaves, tearing apart its many rooms, uprooting floorboards in its hallways, climbing the stairs to count the steps, and pulling back curtains on windows to read dead languages in the stitchwork. As much as it is a novel that ridicules the very act of critical analysis and academic essays while skewering so-called experts' attempts at deciphering symbolism in media, it creates the supreme desire in readers to take up the task themselves, interpreting what it all must mean and how the pieces of such a unique puzzle fit together. Now, just in time for the anniversary of the novel's first appearance in its original online format, a new layer of understanding surfaces. When House of Leaves first made its rounds to visitors in 1999, it was a curiosity of the early internet, showcasing the abilities of early adopters to publish their art and written work independently. It has long been suspected and rumored that, much like the Navidson record itself, a documentary component was made along with Mr. Truant's study of Zampano's manuscript, proving the work was real. But the videos themselves were never found, and their existence could best be described as yet another fictional aspect of this tale. This year, a secret was unveiled in the form of a YouTube channel called Pelican Black, uploads of the long-rumored video diaries of a man who appears to be Johnny Truant, recorded at intervals during his journey through the Navidson record. Going to the About tab on the channel, we find the following description. In 1999, early explorers of the developing internet with a taste for unique stories came across one of the first viral e-published independent works, House of Leaves. The author of this tale, Johnny Truant, has never been identified. Rumor has spread over the years that in keeping his anonymity, Mr. Truant buried the video diaries he recorded documenting the process of putting together House of Leaves. In truth, the videotapes were entrusted to our own small publishing office along with the final manuscript, with explicit instructions that have been followed for 20 years, the amount of time stated by Mr. Truant to keep the diaries from publication. Now, as were his wishes, we carry out part two in a fashion that echoes the spirit of the first circulation of House of Leaves. Many thanks and more blessings to Mr. Truant, wherever he may be. Henson and Kolkater, Chief Editor, Circle Round a Stone Publication. House of Leaves is considered by many to be one of the first true alternate reality games online. Within the reader rages a constant battle over the matters of fact and fiction, intention and distraction, symbolism and subterfuge with constant searches for scattered material related to the novel's references and Johnny Truant himself. It is not merely a book, but a game to solve the case of what is real and what is not, what is legitimate and what is fiction that its creator claims is legitimate, what has been falsified and fed to the audience as reality. Twists, turns, clues and codes abound, creating a winding puzzle box of a book, even in its online edition. 
While there could be work done with the original form of House of Leaves that circulated on the internet in 1999 towards solving its mysteries, the printed novel edition that came the year after presented by the benefactor Mark C. Danielewski made all readers' lives much easier. Or harder, considering the amount of material Johnny Truen added to the printed second edition in the wake of reader questions. It was, at the very least, a very convenient form of assistance provided by Mr. Danielowski, who loved the viral story enough to contact Circle Round a Stone publication and invest funding for a limited print run. This experiment was a massive success, leading to further investment in Circle Round a Stone and a major print run for House of Leaves. Their personal thanks to Mr. Danielowski and Johnny Truant's thanks came in the form of their benefactor's name on the book in the tradition of a producer's headlining credit. All that can be seen as missing is the word presents between Mark C. Danielewski and House of Leaves. Now, having both the novel in its full form readily available and the long-rumored video diaries by Johnny Truant uncovered, House of Leaves has opened its doors for a new blueprinting endeavor. Videos, after all, are a visual medium. And at last, that component exists for a truly deep exploration down the grand staircase. What exactly is House of Leaves? Why was it built this way, and what secrets does it keep? Just who is responsible for all of this? Let us walk into the dark together, as many have done for two decades now, and see what lies in the heart of the house on Ash Tree Lane. The channel created by Circle Round a Stone to upload Johnny's videos, Pelican Black, consists of eight uploads that began on February 23rd, 2019. The first upload, Discovery, opens with an introduction to both our tour guide and his burden in a fashion that sets the stage and tone going forward. I hope I'm not rewriting anything important on here. I don't, uh, I don't think I am. The tapes I used were blank, but I'm not the owner of this camera. Not the original one, anyway. I own it now, but there might not be anything to show for it, except for something I can pawn. The way everything looks in here, it, it might just be a joke. Every tape is just already recorded, but there's nothing on them, just black. And the old man who owned the camera? He was, he was blind. We saw everything he could see recorded on the tapes. The whole thing you're seeing now, it's just the gag. It's not just the tapes, there's all sorts of impossible stuff in here, like this. Look, blind man writes novel, I guess there's an easy way to explain that. <sighs> Seeing as how it's all in different handwriting, I guess a novel is speech made into written word. He could, he could speak. He wasn't mute. His name's all over it. Zampano. Zampano, I... I have no idea how he would have pronounced it. I shouldn't even have this. I shouldn't have... you. A friend showed me... what he... this guy had laying around his place when he died. And it was all heading for the dumpster. Leaving this for the trash seemed wrong. Everything about the place and situation was wrong, but trashing what he left behind seemed worse, especially now that I'm seeing it. You gotta be kidding me. Blind man built dollhouse and looks better than the place you live. Unbelievable. 
The setup we find here is in very stark contrast to half of what can be found in the opening for the printed edition of House of Leaves, an intro also directed by Johnny Truen. The videos on Pelican Black reflect the duality of the introduction through uploads that come much later in the timeline as he grows close to finishing Zampano's manuscript. In his introduction, Johnny seems to cycle between his initial feelings and environment and where he ends up on Halloween. He warns us, takes us back in time, and shows the very grim result of not heeding his warning. The intro leaves us with assurance there is nothing pleasant beyond this point. Ghosts are haunting this house, and when they're encountered, nightmares will follow. Knowledge of Johnny's future does not change his past for us, however, nor does it change for him. We proceed to his examination of Zampano's manuscript, the Navitzen record, and while a trend will emerge displaying his habit of providing insight on the text and what it brings to mind through footnotes, his first video diary reveals a factor previously undiscussed in either edition of the book, setting the pace on our journey to answer the first major question. Just what is House of Leaves? Must S sign? It's the first page of this whole mess. Baby's first words, and they're in German. It's a question, but apparently it's only that way at the start. This is German for must it be, but later it turns into S must sign. And you can track it down in two places. First, Beethoven. This is in reference to his 16th string quartet, the last major thing he ever wrote. Beethoven called a movement in the piece the difficult decision. During the first half of the movement, when the music is slow, he writes, Muss es sein, asking, must it be? Then, while considering the difficult decision, the music speeds up and returns the answer. Es muss sein. It must be. It's almost like the old man was asking himself, just as he started writing, Do I have to? Must it be? Turns out the answer was yes. He had to. It must be. An entire trunk's worth of I had to. Second reference. A novel called The Unbearable Lightness of Being. One of the characters in the story, Thomas, is facing a difficult decision. He needs to choose whether or not to leave Zurich and follow his wife, Teresa, back to Prague, who left him in Zurich after he cheated on her, which is something he's done before in their marriage. He declares, Es muss sein, it must be, saying his fate is to follow Teresa. The novel's mostly about infidelity and love triangles taking place during the Soviet invasion. Tomas is a surgeon, and his wife Teresa is a photojournalist who spends a lot of time away from him taking pictures on the front line of the conflict. At first, it seems like an odd choice of reference, and it could have just been a coincidence that Esmus Sain lands here, but... Well, the old man is clever. Clever indeed. As Johnny goes on to tell us, Zampano's first two chapters cover the foundation of the Navitzen record, from the legacy of the film to its opening premise. We also see the beginning of his footnotes, which will continue throughout the entire piece. Johnny himself will add to these footnotes at points of interest, as seen on page 8, chapter 2. Not the first, and definitely not the last time, Zampano implies that the Navitzen record exists. References and resources that just aren't real or can never be sourced are littered throughout the manuscript, mixed in with references that are legitimate. It's almost as if the real sources are bait. It gives you an authentic piece of information so you never investigate the rest. You just take it all, hook, line, and sinker. That or maybe I'm just not well-read enough. But I'll tell you this. The whole manuscript about this documentary called the Navitzen Record, it can't exist. I've never heard of it. The guy at the video store has never heard of it. The clerk at the movie theater has never heard of it. Tarantino has been tearing up the scene around here for two films in a row now. It's not like independent or under the radar stuff doesn't ever get noticed, especially when it makes an impact like Zampano claims it does. The Navidson record is a ghost story. And like any good ghost story, it begins quaintly, 
normally and with a sense of optimism. Well, Davidson, his girlfriend Karen Green, and their two children move into a home to settle down as a family. According to the text, after nearly 11 years of constant departures and brief returns, Karen has made it clear that Davidson must either give up his professional habits or lose his family. Ultimately unable to make this choice, he compromises by turning reconciliation into a subject for documentation. Will Navy Navidson is a professional photographer who specializes in photojournalism jobs involving the world's most serious subjects. His career has brought him to refugee camps, the front lines of war zones, disaster areas. You name it, he's been there. And it has absolutely taken a toll on his family life even as it's brought financial security and notoriety. His girlfriend Karen has been no stranger to the limelight and its benefits either, spending her working years modeling for the Ford Agency in New York, providing magazines and fashion shows the world over an example of perfect figure and light-haired beauty. While Karen could work relatively close to home and still care for their children, 8-year-old Chad and 5-year-old Daisy, Will's job required much more commitment and sacrifice. Now it's time to bring commitment and sacrifice to the place that it's most needed. Home. But even this is painful for Will Davidson. If he can't record or photograph something, he can't live. So he turns the event of a family moving into a new home the subject of a documentary. It's funny, Davidson tells us at the outset. I just want to create a record of how Karen and I bought a small house in the country and moved into it with our children. Sort of see how everything turns out. No gunfire, famine, or flies. Just lots of toothpaste, gardening, and people stuff. Davidson, we learn, began his project by mounting a number of hi eights around the house and equipping them with motion detectors to turn them on and off whenever someone enters or leaves the room. With the exception of the three bathrooms, there are cameras in every corner of the house. Davidson also keeps on hand two 16mm Aeroflexes and his usual battery of 35mm cameras. Gotta be kidding me. Who did he find with all the patience to do this for? Do you see this? You've gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I was just reading some pages earlier telling me about the cameras put all over the house in the documentary. I can't believe they're here too. In the miniature. While the presence of cameras in the dollhouse is fascinating, Davidson's subject for the documentary is anything but enticing to the normal person, and we're left to wonder why he believes it's worth recording. Zampano illustrates that Will Davidson's idea stems from the psychology that he can't seem to make anything real unless he can point a camera at it. The home video project doesn't stop at wall-mounted recording. Navy insists he and Karen have personal cameras to make video diaries, unfiltered, with no ability to review them until the project is done. This, perhaps, is what Navy knows to be the real hook for an audience. The comparison between what happens on public cameras and what's shared in personal recordings. It certainly drew more cynical viewers of the film who knew rumors about the Navidson couple. Zampano writes about the ghosts of infidelity haunting them due to Karen's moments of allegedly cheating on Will when he was overseas. Some rather vicious commentary is quoted about one viewer's opinion of Karen Green, which, as Zampano said, blows high the roof beams. The most mild thing this writer commented is this. How can she say she loves a man when she's incapable of anything even remotely resembling commitment? Buckman is not alone in her opinion. Dale Cordigan also pointed out that Karen was anything but a loving housewife. Karen hardly gave up the promiscuous behavior that marked her early 20s. She only became more discreet. And there it is. Must S sign. S must sign. Thomas and Teresa were a pair who had issues about a partner cheating in their relationship while the other was away. The person who was away, Teresa, was a photojournalist. And here we have Will Navidson, hotshot world-traveling photographer, trying to lock down a relationship with Karen, who apparently pulled a Thomas during the time Navy was away. Sorry if it feels like I'm all over the place or I took a detour, but it's always part of the road. I, I promise. Sometimes you just need to check something out on the side. And <laughs> don't blame me for the choppy film work either. I'm no Will Navidson. It won't be the last time Johnny makes what seems like a detour. 
Anyone who reads House of Leaves knows that Mr. Truant takes absence from the tale at several points to inform us what's happening in his own life, which, while at first may seem like sidetracking, is indeed part of the journey. On page 12, we read about Karen waiting for Will to come home while she watches the kids, a study of her habit of loving Will in private while putting on a colder, more serious facade in person. When he arrives, she tells Navy the water heater is having issues, prompting our first written diary entry from Johnny, who tells us his water heater is broken, which is terrible considering how badly he needed a shower after a night hanging out with Lude at the bar. Johnny writes that they ended up at this joint on Pico and found themselves talking to some girls wearing black cowboy hats. Lude, being a professional hairstylist by trade, offered to prove his skill set by giving one of them a trim, right then and there. There he goes, Johnny says. Snipping locks and bangs, doing a great job too, but hey, he's a pro. And all of it in the dark too, on a bar stool. Surrounded by dozens of who knows who, fingers and steel clicking away, tiny bits of hair spitting off into the surrounding turmoil. The girls all nervous until they see he really is a pro and then they're immediately chirping me next and do me, which is too easy to remark upon. So instead, Lude and I remark upon something else, which this time round is all about some insane adventure I supposedly had when I was a pit boxer. Mind you, I'd never heard that term before, nor had Lude. Lude just made it up, and I went with it. And so he did, spinning a tale on the spot about the time he was a pit boxer, which all began with his escape from a ship because he owed a thousand dollars to its captain after losing a bet in Singapore. Don't forget to tell them about the birds, Lude interjected. Johnny informs us this is common of Lude. He'll begin a story and Lude will toss him a new turn to juggle. Now he had to incorporate birds, and to his credit, he pulls it off. Johnny's tale involves nearly being mugged by a man after escaping from the ship, which was full of contraband. Everything from outlawed consumables to exotic birds. The mugging did not go in the assailant's favor as Johnny struck him hard and down he went. Out of the darkness came another man who congratulated him along with the mugger. Johnny just qualified for the position they were looking to fill in their pit boxing ring. $200 a night to knock someone out. See the scar on his eyebrow there? Lude pointed, giving the girls one of those all-knowing completely over-the-top nods. Is that how you broke your front tooth too? The girl with a ruby pin in her cowboy hat blurted out. Though as soon as she said it, I could see she felt bad about mentioning my busted incisor. I'm getting to that, I said with a smile. Why not work the tooth into it too? And so he did, weaving a tale of perfect knockouts, only to be told by his managing duo later it was all a setup. They made more money tricking people into betting on Johnny than they had to spend paying the other guy to lose. So every night, the fight was fixed. Now, if Johnny wanted to really make a killing and claim his due, he just had to bet on himself. So he went for it, only to find his opponent was the manager who set him up. A professional fighter turned con man. Johnny was decimated in the pit, his tooth broken in the process, and now completely out of luck, humiliated, poor, and on the run again. That was when he hatched a plot to turn things back in his favor. He led the managing duo to the ship he escaped from, promising a much bigger score than they made in the pit, and ran off to find his captain, who at first was enraged, but calmed down when Johnny told him his money was on board. They used very selective language with the pit boxers to arrange a deal and sold several crates of onboard contraband, securing the money Johnny owed and much more. After getting back out to sea, Johnny said his captain was still laughing about the con. He didn't get any of his personal money back though, as the captain said it was his for saving Johnny's life and giving him a ride to their next stop. But it wasn't so bad. After all, it was still funny years later to imagine how the pit boxers reacted when they opened all the contraband boxes and found over 50 birds of paradise. Which was pretty much how that story ended, or at least the story I told last night. Maybe not verbatim, but close. Unfortunately, nothing happened with the girls. They just ran off giggling into the night. No digits, no dates, not even their names, leaving me feeling dumb and sad, a bit like a broken thermos. Fine on the outside, but on the inside, nothing but busted glass. And why I'm going on about any of this right now is beyond me. I've never even seen a bird of paradise. I sure have never boxed or been on a barge. In fact, just looking at this story makes me feel a little queasy all of a sudden. I mean how fake it is. Just sorta of doesn't sit right with me. Johnny leaves us with a comment about discovering the broken water heater the following morning, 
Thankfully, he spotted some workers trying to fix it at his building, and with that knowledge, he comes clean. Now I'm sure you're wondering something. Is it just coincidence that this cold water predicament of mine also appears in this chapter? Not at all. Zapano only wrote heater. The word water back there? I added that. Now there's an admission, eh? The next time we hear from Johnny, more admissions follow, inspired by a quote he translates at the start of chapter 3 reflecting its overall topic. Dante, Canto 2, lines 31 to 32. But I, why should I go there and who grants it? I am not Aeneas. I am not Paul. A question I'm often asking myself these days, though not the Aeneas-Paul part. The simple answer I know. Lude woke me up at 3 in the morning to check out some dead guy stuff. Johnny goes on to talk about the habits he and Lude share in their endless drift through Hollywood nightlife, which usually involves Johnny's personal specialty, storytelling. I have a whole bunch, he writes. Take the scars, for instance. Now, instead of a broken tooth and pit boxing, we hear about the scars that line Johnny's forearms. All those whirls of melted flesh. He has a few variations on those, the best of which is how they come from a Japanese martial arts cult back in Idaho. I'm sure most women know it's bull, but hey, they're entertained. I also think it's somewhat of a relief not to hear the true story. I mean, you look at the horror sweeping all the way up from my wrists to my elbows, and you have to take a deep breath and ask yourself, do I really want to know what happened there? In my experience, most people don't. They usually look away. My stories actually help them look away. Maybe they even help me look away. But I guess that's nothing new. We all create stories to protect ourselves. You know, when you tell a story, you're not supposed to get too out of yourself. Things happen in order. Event A creates event B, and onto event C, and so forth. Sometimes, though, you're just hyping people up for what's to come. Teasing them a little. I can't tell whether Zimpano was a performer or a poser. Some have suggested that the horrors Navidson encountered in that house were merely manifestations of his own troubled psyche. Dr. Ivan Van Pollitt, in his book The Incident, claims the entire house is a physical incarnation of Navidson's psychological pain. I often wonder how things might have turned out if Will Navidson had, how shall we say, done a little bit of house cleaning. Now, See, I could maybe get on board with that if I knew what horrors we were even talking about in the first place. <sighs> kind of hard to provide analysis for something you haven't even shown off yet. It's March now. Johnny's had three months with Zampano's trunk and has added to the pile of paper scraps and signed by accumulating over 200 rejection letters from various literary journals, publishing houses, even a few words of discouragement from prominent professors. Only he wants Zampano's remains. I'm a sucker for abandoned stuff, misplaced stuff, forgotten stuff, any old stuff which, despite the light of progress and all that, still vanishes every day like shadows at noon, goings unheralded, passings unmourned. Eh, well, you get the drift. Johnny was once told by a counselor for disaffected youth that he likes it because it reminds him of himself. He doesn't disagree. Seems pretty dead on and probably has everything to do with the fact that when I was ten my father died and almost nine years later my crazy Shakespearean mother followed him. Apparently, Navison's childhood was a lot of fun. His family moved every two to three years, so home wasn't a permanent concept. His father was a violent alcoholic and his mother was an actress obsessed with ladder climbing. She was last seen in a Los Angeles bar smoking a cigarette and talking about Moonlight and why you could find so much of it in Hollywood. Neither Will nor his twin brother Tom ever heard from her again. Because the enormous narcissism of their parents deprived Will and Tom of any suitable role models, both brothers learned to identify with absence. Consequently, even if something beneficial fortuitously entered their lives, they immediately treated it as temporary. Zampano writes that maybe Navidson took up photography because it was his way of seeing something and making it stay. A, a photo is a photo. It stays the way you take it, frozen in time. 
I guess the section about Navitson drinking lemonade on his porch and explaining the documentary is the way it gets rubbed in. Photography is just how he deals with things. It's how he speaks. As for the question of why it was him that ended up in the house, we get this, and it's... On history, talent, and emotional background, only Navidson could have gone as deep as he did and still have successfully brought that vision back. Footnote credited to Zampano himself. This chapter first appeared as The Matter of Why in LA Weekly, May 19th, 1992. You might imagine I'm in a pretty good situation for hunting down that copy of LA Weekly and seeing if it's real. You're right, but there's no article inside about anything even remotely related to the Navidson record. The horror speculated to be the result of Will Navidson's psyche first manifests in a form contrary to common expectations. According to the text, in early June of 1990, the Navidsons flew to Seattle for a wedding. When they returned, something in the house had changed. Upstairs in the master bedroom, we discover along with Will and Karen a plain white door with a glass knob. It does not, however, open into the children's room, but into a space resembling a walk-in closet. However, unlike other closets in the house, this one lacks outlets, sockets, switches, shelves, a rod on which to hang things, or even some decorative molding. Instead, the walls are perfectly smooth and almost pure black. Almost because there is a slightly gray quality to the surface. The space cannot be more than five feet wide and at most four feet long. On the opposite end, a second door, identical to the first one, opens up into the children's bedroom. Will and Karen wonder if they just overlooked the hallway. It seems absurd, but what else could they do? Karen digs up a photo from when they moved in. There was no door on that wall. The effect of the doorway's appearance is not simply felt by the Navidsons. On the Pelican Black channel, we find upload number four, Uncanny. I, uh, translated the German in chapter four. Got it done last night. I went to work today. Last time I got all the way up to breakfast in the house, something about the orange juice and NPR. It took me a minute to write down some general advice when it comes to Zampano's detours or excessive writings. By the end, I didn't even know where I was heading, so I went back to that big German passage at the start to copy it down and called it a night. It's been sitting around for about a week while I looked for some way to crack it, and I finally got it done. Did it last night. Yeah, so it's done. Uh, today I got home, picked it back up, went to where we meet my brother Tom, and I realized I missed something. Maybe. This is it, right? The Davidson house? Do you remember how it looked before? I looked at the tapes I made last time. When I first opened this, I remember what it looked like. I know what it looked like. In this hallway? These doors? They, they weren't there. They're here now. They're on the tapes too, but I know they weren't. Johnny is just as baffled as Karen and Will, and all three characters seek an immediate remedy. Johnny checks the tapes from before and finds something we can't see on our side. The house shows the doors having been there. 
Karen and Will check out a blueprint of their full-size edition of the house, which shows there is a crawl space between the bedrooms, but that doesn't explain the appearance of doors. Will Davidson's curiosity leads him to another equally disturbing find. He starts comparing the dimensions indicated in the plans with those he personally takes. Very soon he realizes not everything adds up. Something, in fact, is very wrong. Davidson climbs a ladder outside to the upper floor, a painful act thanks to a skin condition affecting his toes since childhood. A measurement is taken of the outside of the house, from the far wall of the master bedroom to the far wall of the kids' room. The result is impossible. The inside of the house exceeds the outside by one quarter of an inch. Will Davidson and Johnny Truen are both left feeling like they perfectly understand the contents of the German passage found in this chapter. In anxiety, one feels uncanny, the nothing and nowhere, but here uncanniness also means not being at home. This passage translated by Johnny is accompanied by a bit of personal information on how long his day actually was. When I copied the German down a week ago, I was fine. Then last night I found the translation and this morning when I went into work, I didn't feel at all myself. It's probably just a coincidence. I mean that there's some kind of connection between my state of mind and the Navidson record or even a few arcane sentences on existence. More than likely, it's something entirely else. The real root lying in my already strange mood fluctuations. Though I guess those are pretty recent too. Rocking back and forth between wishful thinking and some private agony until the bar breaks. Johnny writes about his job at a tattoo shop. He does all the work for maintaining a store of this nature outside of actually providing tattoos. Mostly, he's been employed for his talent crafting needlepoints. This afternoon, though, how do I explain it? Something's really off. I'm off. I just keep staring at all the ink we have, that wild variety of color. Everything from root beer, midnight blue, and cochineal to mauve, light doe, lilac, south sea green, maize, even pelican black all lined up in these plastic caps like tiny transparent thimbles. I don't know what I need, but for no apparent reason, I'm going terribly south. Nothing has happened, absolutely nothing, but I'm still having problems breathing. Johnny gets a drink of water, heads into the hallway, and the world goes dark. Not pitch black, mind you, he says. Not even power failure black, a storm passing over the sun. Except there is no storm and there are no clouds. The day is bright. But then my nostrils flare with the scent of something bitter and foul, something inhuman, reeking with so much rot in years, telling me in the language of nausea that I'm not alone. Something's behind me. Of course, I deny it. It's impossible to deny. I want to puke. Johnny didn't. He didn't want to turn around either. Didn't want to look. But he did. Johnny looked, fast as he could, fast as whiplash, and he did see it. He saw it before he turned. It felt exactly as if in fact I had turned and at that instant caught sight of some tremendous beast crouched off in the shadows, muscles a twitch from firing its great mass forward, ragged claws slowly extending, digging into the linoleum, even as its eyes are dilating beyond the point of reason, completely obliterating the iris. And by that widening fire, the glowing furnace of witness, a camera lucida with me in silhouette, like some silly hand shadow twitching about upside down. Is that right? Or am I getting confused? Either way, registering at last the sign it must have been waiting for. My own recognition of exactly what has been awaiting me all along. But at the moment of his turn, Johnny saw nothing. The lights were back. The sickly rotting smell was gone. Nausea dissipated. But something did remain. Maybe it had just brushed past me, like someone easing by in a dark room, the face lost in shadow. My thoughts lost in another conversation. Though something in her movement or perfume is disturbingly familiar. Though how familiar is impossible to tell because by the time I realize she's someone I should know, she's already gone. Deep into the den, beyond the bar, taking with her any chance of recognition. Though she hasn't left, she's still there, embracing shadows. Is that it? Had I been thinking of a woman? I don't know. I hope it doesn't matter. I have a terrifying feeling it does. Hallways are not safe places. In the video on this day, we find Johnny is already done with anything related to the Navidson record now that he's seen a change in the dollhouse. He'll return to the manuscript another day. 
After Johnny gets some rest, the plot progresses. Navy's brother Tom is called. They're fraternal twins and haven't spoken much in the course of eight years. The strictly fraternal nature of their twin status reflects their clashing personalities. As Karen puts it quite simply, Navy's successful, Tom's not. Will Navidson is a globe-trotting, award-winning journalist with a model girlfriend and two kids. Tom is overweight, single, and has traded alcoholism for smoking, living life under the radar. But when Will calls, Tom answers, driving from Lowell, Massachusetts down to Virginia, where the Navidsons now live on Ash Tree Lane. Navy and Tom attempt to solve the mystery of the impossible quarter inch, but even Tom's set of tools can't solve the matter. They turn to Navy's friend Billy Reston, an engineering teacher he met years ago at a construction site, who ended up the subject of one of Navy's photographs when a high-voltage cable fell on him. Will was too fond to provide any sort of assistance as Billy ran from disaster, but he was far enough to get a clear picture. The photo ended up framed on Reston's office wall at the University of Virginia, where anyone who wonders what put him in a wheelchair can now see for themselves. He offers Will a laser level that should do the trick and says if they still have problems, he'll come down to the house himself and get rid of their quarter-inch ghost. Meanwhile, Karen has already found her remedy for the impossible hallway. Navy seeks to solve the mystery. Karen wants to show the mystery how much she doesn't care by building a bookshelf in the bedroom with the help of a friend. It's during Karen's activity we receive a footnote diary from Johnny, discussing his encounter with a new pair of female friends courtesy of Zampano. Johnny writes about a girl named Amber, who had been assisting the old man, a name and number on a long list of them found in the black trunk. Johnny invited her to get drinks so they could discuss Zampano and his work, resulting in a trip to the Viper with Lude. Her impression of Zampano was funny and sobering, a man who loved to brag about how uneducated he was while being a wealth of knowledge and understanding, and yet, a very lonely soul who hid it well. Johnny ended up back at Amber's place where she called her friend Christina. Unconventional use of a seedy case as the serving platter for a party favor came next, followed by a game of spin the bottle after draining the wine. But amid three-way kisses and all the activities that followed, Johnny felt his mind slipping away, thoughts turning from the women he was entertaining to worries of what his father would think of him. If what Johnny was experiencing was the same high and joy and confident recklessness that came from his dad's life as a pilot, his father, who loved the air, the tender sky that never once let him down, preserving his attachment to youth, propriety, and kindness. And so only now, Johnny wrote, days later, as I give these moments shape here, do I re-encounter what my high briefly withheld. The covering memory permanently hitched to everything preceding it and so prohibiting all of it. Those memories, the good ones, no matter how different, how blissful. Eclipsed by the jackknife trailer across the highway. The tractor truck lodged in the stony ditch off the shoulder. Oily smoke billowing up into the night. A racing train of thought headed into darkness follows. Fire itself crawling up from the punctured fuel tanks, stripping the paint, melting the tires and blackening the shattered glass. Windshield struck from within. A ten-year-old boy with ink on his fingers from the image they wore away at in a newspaper, trying to dissolve the black sky and bring back the blue. In the original online version of House of Leaves, diary footnotes like these left readers with many questions, prompting a need in the print run to provide answers. So it is that House of Leaves comes with two appendixes, one of material from Zampano's trunk and one of material Johnny provides. In Johnny's appendix, part D, we find an obituary telling us the story of his father. Mr. Truant's first name was Donnie, and he was a dedicated flyer, first serving in the Air Force, then as a crop duster in Nebraska, a mail carrier in Alaska, and one winter flying a spotter plane off the coast of Norway. This led to a commercial pilot job, with time taken off to fly stunt planes and regional air shows. Johnny's father attempted to renew his pilot license in 1980 and seek a job that would let him spend more time with his family, but it was discovered that at some point during sleep, he experienced a cardiac infarction. His license was suspended for six months, and in the meantime, he found work at a trucking company. One Sunday in July, 1981, the Mack truck he was in swerved into a ditch and caught fire. The driver, who had fallen asleep at the wheel, survived. Mr. Truant left behind a wife and ten-year-old Johnny. What common ground lies between the building of bookshelves for Karen and the communion of bodies for Johnny? Both pleasure activities end in pain. When Tom and Navy bring Reston's laser level to the house, they find it. The correct measurement, the right measurement, an equal interior and exterior. 
Goodbye, Mr. Faction, Tom says. But Navy insists one more time. He needs to be sure. A slight draft is moving one of the closet doors and it needs to be held in place. Tom takes a book from one of Karen's shelves for a doorstop, kicking off a domino effect, knocking some of her volumes to the floor. On turning to look, Karen screams. When Karen built her shelving, she didn't need to worry about bookends. The shelves ran from wall to wall with no open space on either end. Once Tom had taken a book, it revealed what happened when all of their bags were turned. There was now at least a foot of space between the end of the shelf and the wall. The room had grown in size. There's a lot to this one. So much that I don't even know if it's supposed to be one chapter. It feels like two stuck together. It doesn't help that it opens like this, up before the horse again. After the stuff about the bookshelf, Sampano writes about the Greek myth of Echo. We can't appreciate the importance of space in the Nevinson record if we don't understand Echoes, apparently. They have a literal and thematic presence. Echo's story is sad. No matter what version you get, she was a mountain and very beautiful, but that beauty doesn't count for anything when all that's left at the end is your voice. Take one. Echo helps Zeus pull someone into bed that he wanted to give the thunder of the gods, which is how most of Zeus's stories go. His wife Hera found out Echo helped him cheat and punished her by making it impossible to say anything except for the last few sounds anyone says. Hiding in isolation, Echo fell in love with Narcissus. But Narcissus being Narcissus, he only had eyes for himself. And Echo wasted away, leaving nothing but her voice, which mimicked the end of everything he said. Take number two. The god Pan falls in love with Echo. Echo's not into guys who have hooves instead of feet. So he rips her apart and buries every last bit except for her voice. Very romantic. There. Like I said, there's a lot here. I don't even know why I turned the camera on. I've already said what I needed to. I'm not about to repeat myself. It's plain to see from this upload that by the point he reached Chapter 5, Johnny wasn't doing very well, but the text alone has already informed us of that. On page 42, we find a footnote marked by a symbol translating the passage Zampano references concerning Echo. So she was turned away to hide her face, her lips, her guilt among the trees, even their leaves the hot caves of the forest, to feed her love on melancholy sorrow, which, sleepless, turned her body to a shade, first pale and wrinkled, then a sheet of air, then bones which some say turned to thin worn rocks, and last her voice remained, vanished in forest, Far from her usual walks on hills and valleys, she's heard by all who call. Her voice has life. This leads to Zampano writing, To repeat, her voice has life. It possesses a quality not present in the original, revealing how a nymph can return a different and more meaningful story, in spite of telling the same story. To quote Johnny, The old man is clever. The secret in the statement he makes here is itself reminiscent of Echo. She has two origin stories. Both of them are the same, but with variation. The nymph tells her story twice, but it's different each time. And yet, it's the same story. This idea is something Zampano seems to understand maybe too deeply for us to comprehend, as we see in footnote 49, spinning off the last sentence on the page. Zampano provides a passage from Don Quixote that is used verbatim by another author, but says, this exquisite variation on the passage by the ingenious layman is far too dense to unpack here. Trying to discern the sorrow, accusation, and sarcasm Zampano mentioned picking up in the second passage seems to infuriate Johnny, who doesn't know how anybody could write about exquisite variation when both passages are the same. The more I focused in on the words, the farther I seem from my room. No sense where, either, until all of a sudden along the edges of my tongue, towards the back of my mouth, I started to taste something extremely bitter, almost metallic. 
I began to gag. I didn't gag, but I was certain I would. Johnny picked up the scent he had first encountered in the hallway when he suffered some form of attack at the tattoo shop, with seeping rot. He wrote that he threw up, but he didn't throw up. He coughed. But no, not even that, he didn't cough. He cleared his throat and the smell was gone, the taste was gone in the room, his room was back. He did not know what happened, but he could see what was happening. My line of defense has not only failed, it failed long ago. Don't ask me to define the line either or why exactly it's needed or even what it stands in defense against. Zampano's writing on Echo goes on to describe two passages that are exactly the same with just one word change, the reverberation of a pebble falling down the well, and the ability of bats to see through echolocation, ending his piece by saying, Echolocation comes down to the crude assessment of simple sound modulations, whether in the dull reply of a tapping cane or the low, eerie flutter in one simple word, perhaps your word, flung down empty hallways long past midnight. Johnny says we can probably see the intensely personal nature of Zampano writing about bats in echolocation, and that one idea he'd written, about a word flung down an empty hallway past midnight, perhaps your word, our word, conjured ideas of the old man himself, feeling his way around the walls of another evening, a slow and tedious progress but one which begins to yield somehow the story of his own creature darkness, taking me completely by surprise, a sudden charge from out of the dullest moment, jaws lunging open, claws protracting, long past midnight one claw and empty hallways another. Johnny asked Lude what he thought. Lude told him a claw is made out of bone, just like a stilt is made out of steel. And while I wanted to believe Lude's basics, I couldn't. It was something just so awful in the old man's utterance. I felt a terrible empathy for him then, living in that tiny place permeated with the odor of age, useless blinks against the darkness. His word, my word, maybe even your word, added to this, and ringing inside me like some awful dream over and over again, modulating slightly, slowly pitching my own defenses into something entirely different until the music of that recurrence drew into relief my own scars drawn long ago over two decades ago, with more than a claw. And the passage goes on, a relentless train of thought speeding up along the track running over images and ideas, memories of violence, scenes of tragic destruction, accidents and loss, a mother and her son left alone, a mother and her son already alone, and a little silver shape kept on a cold gold chain, all possibilities of harm, every threat, every move, a thousand and one possible claws. They moved on from the bar to a party with a motorcycle still running at the bottom of a pool and a girl being treated for a bloody nose. When Lude grabbed a bottle seeking obliteration, Johnny joined him. But come morning, despite my headache and the vomit on my shirt, I knew I'd failed. Inside me a long dark hallway already caressed the other music of a single word, and what's worse, despite the amazements of chemicals, continued to grow. I don't want to admit that I get it. It's a lot of front-loading without cause, explanation, without mystery. It's like detours for the sake of detours unless you actually consider what's being given. That takes acceptance. Then what you have turns into possibility or even worse, the truth. If you learn the truth, don't know what it means, you get an answer and nobody asked you the question, you're responsible for finding the question. It's a riddle in reverse. What's best sign? Best most sign. That's why you wrote that. That's why you wrote the whole echo nonsense. And that's why he keeps putting the cart before the horse. Because an echo, it's an altered version. It's a twisted mimic. It doesn't matter what it was, Zeus or Pan, as long as you know what happened in the end. What's a sign? This must sign. Must be? It must be. What does that sound like to you? One half question, one half answer. One full message. It's an echo. The unbearable lightness of being, the novel it came from, with Tomas and Teresa, meet Will Mavidson and Karen Green, 
photojournalist with a cheating spouse meets photojournalist with a cheating spouse. Zeus and Echo meet Pan and Echo. So why am I so mad? Why are you getting upset about it, Johnny? I found this this morning. I read up to page 57 the night before. Jotted down a footnote about a discrepancy in the writing. Finished the passage and went to bed. I barely slept all night because I knew I could check. If I just got up. I just had to walk down the hall. I wanted to. I didn't want to. I knew if there was a rhyme to this, I needed to wait until morning. I thought that would give me a reason. If you win, you lose. Echo learned that helping Zeus. The long winding passages about Echo in Chapter 5 were not the entirety of the piece. It eventually returned to events in the Navidson house, which only increased in severity following the discovery prompted by Karen's bookshelf. Billy Reston comes over to investigate himself, as promised. The mystery baffles even him, and though there's obviously a lot of research to be done here, neither he nor Tom can stick around. The two leave, returning us to a house of Karen and Will alone with the children, left mostly unsupervised, bringing forth a new development. According to Zampano's text, the alienation of their children finally became apparent to both of them one evening in the middle of July. Karen is upstairs, sitting on the bed with a deck of tarot cards. Davidson is downstairs in his study examining slides from a lab. Chad and Daisy can be heard squealing about something, their voices peeling through the house. This is when the cameras installed in each room reveal how Karen and Will both realize the sound isn't quite right. The terrifying implication of their children's shouts is now impossible to miss. No room in the house exceeds a length of 25 feet, let alone 50 feet, let alone 56 and a half feet, and yet Chad and Daisy's voices are echoing, each call responding with an entirely separate answer. In the living room, Davidson discovers the echoes emanating from a dark doorless hallway which has appeared out of nowhere on the west wall. Navy runs in after them and soon reappears with Chan and Daisy held under each arm. Karen is found in a terrible state in the living room, sweating and hugging the children as if they just narrowly avoided a road accident. Johnny takes issue with what's been written about this moment, which became known to cult video collectors as the five and a half minute hallway before the release of the full movie. He mentions how in prior writing by Zampano, the door was supposed to be on the north wall of the living room. Now we read that it's appeared in the west wall. And this should be the moment the quarter finally drops. Remember for a moment Johnny's confusion over the same exact passage in two places during the Echo chapter with Zampano's insistence about their differences. Those very fine nuances, almost undetectable. Same thing, different positions. Slight change, but same meaning. The differences are no difference. And even with the difference, it's easy to compare the two passages Zampano brings up with one word changing, which doesn't really affect the overall meaning or outcome at all. North wall, west wall. So, you ask? So look back to the matter of words flung down empty hallways long past midnight in Johnny's diary footnote. Inside me, a long dark hallway already caressed the other music of a single word, and what's worse, despite the amazements of chemicals, continued to grow. Now I'm sure you're wondering something. Is it just coincidence that this cold water predicament of mine also appears in this chapter? Not at all. Zampano only wrote heater. The word water back there. I added that. Now there's an admission, eh? Broken heater. Broken water heater. North wall. West wall. Zeus and Echo, Pan and Echo, Thomas and Teresa, Will and Karen, Moose is sign, yes, Moose sign. <laughs> must it be? Oh, it must be. You see it now, don't you? Or should I say you hear it? But the echoes Johnny experiences don't end there. Within the chapter, we find a story of his own intersecting the place between discussion of the Echo myth and continuation of the Navidson record. Page 50, Zampano writes, Myth makes Echo the subject of longing and desire. Physics makes Echo the subject of distance and design. Where emotion and reason are concerned, both claims are accurate. West wall, north wall, myth, science. They are not opposite or parallel, they are adjacent. Echo the mythical, the beautiful nymph, the object of desire, who became full of desire herself, 
pining away after self-obsessed narcissists until only her voice remained. Echo the physical inspired by the myth, calling up its own echoes of beauty and the mystical, but resulting in a matter of distance and design that creates the impression of loneliness and fear. Johnny's diary footnote on page 50, footnote number 65, is prompted by the end of Zampano's writing about the nature of Echo, her mythical and scientific interpretations. We're told a story about Johnny taking home a woman named Lucy after going out with Lude and how she reminded him of a woman he met a while back, who ended up appearing in the tattoo shop quite often. Thumper, an adult dancer, whose tattoo of the Bambi character granted her the name. He had fallen for her before even ten whole words were shared between them. And what an interesting place for Johnny to remember this and write it all down. Back at the Navidson house, Tom returns in an attempt to push back the otherworldly intrusion in the living room, installing a heavy door with four deadbolts, coloring the keys to match the locks. Red, yellow, green, and blue. His help is appreciated by the Navidson couple, but ultimately unsuccessful in settling tensions. Video diaries with Karen and Will reveal that since getting back from Seattle and finding the hallway upstairs, their relationship has been on a decline. Physical intimacy is low. Conversation is just as bad. All Davidson wants to do is go into the hallway and document what's happening, but all Karen wants is for him to stay away. She says that if he goes inside, she's taking the kids and leaving. Navy says that if she continues to be cold and obstructive about this, he's absolutely going. In August, friends drop by to have dinner. Lots of catching up is done. Good mood, good food, good talk. Until Will is reminded of all the adventures he used to have and how settling down means no more crazy Navy, inspiring him to show their friends the hallway, which immediately angers Karen. That night, she tells Navy he can sleep on the couch with his beloved hallway. No surprise, Davidson fails to fall asleep, Zampano writes. He tosses around for an hour until he finally gets up and goes off in search of his camera. A title card reads, Exploration A. The timestamp on Davidson's camcorder indicates that it is exactly 3.19 a.m. Call me impetuous or just curious, we hear him mutter as he shoves his sore feet into a pair of boots, but a little look around isn't going to hurt. Without ceremony, he unlocks the door and slips across the threshold. Found this today. Woke up, got my jacket, reached inside to lock my door when I left nearly threw my keys into the street. Did you know what? I should've. I really should've. I know the game now. I do. I get the joke. Will and Karen leave, go to Seattle, come back. Something changes in the house. Nothing crazy, just a hallway. I leave my place, go to work, go out with Lud, go to the store. Someone changed the dollhouse. Crazy Carpenter got to me too. <laughs> yeah. I get it. It's sick, but I get it. Absolutely hysterical. I don't want to think it's Lou, but he's the only one who knows I have this trunk. He's the only one who knew the old man. Zampano's dead. Zampano's a pile of ashes right now. He can't get up and break in and play poltergeist. I called Lou at the shop, gave him an earful. He swore he didn't know what I was talking about. I swore on his mother. Right after work, I bought a new lock for my front door. Bought a new knob, too. Two new keys to get in. I checked the windows to make sure that they were locked. There's so much dirt still on them. I know they haven't been open. Someone's been coming through the door. They must have. They messed up, though. Two reasons. One, these keys are too big for the locks. Obviously. Two, even with teeny tiny wooden keys, you can't get this open because there aren't any keyholes. <sighs> I think I'm crazy. Now I know what crazy looks like. When Will Davidson enters the hallway, he finds it to be long, dark, and seemingly without end. He made a promise to never go inside and his feet are in no condition for walking a mile, let alone however deep this goes. There is no historical or scientific precedent for this sort of event in the history of the world to the best of his knowledge. Still, he turns on a flashlight and heads down the hallway. Davidson first reports to his camera that it's cold. Very cold. We see the walls are as dark as they first appear and seem to be just like those in the upstairs hallway. This hall is about 70 feet long, but does not end there. 
A right turn stretches even farther into the dark than the one before it, and later opens to a new hallway, this time on the left. According to the text, it is at least 15 feet wide with a ceiling well over 10 feet high. The length of this one, however, is impossible to estimate as Navidson's flashlight proves useless against the darkness ahead, dying long before it can ever come close to determining an end. Further down, doorways appear, with empty rooms beyond. There are no windows. Sometimes the flashlight lands on spaces that can be seen, and sometimes drifts away into darkness. Eventually, Will comes to an entrance that reveals a very large space, enormous enough for the flashlight to fail in reaching walls or a ceiling. In the darkness, a growl echoes out. It is time to leave. But Will has become lost. He cries out, first in fear, then frustration, hearing his own echoes ripple across space. It strikes him to use the echoes to make his way back. Depending on the sound, there must be a wall, and where there was a wall, there was some direction. Again, that faint growl returns, rolling through the darkness like thunder. Panic leaves Will Navidson and readers alike entirely unsure of whether the environment has changed of its own accord or if he's found a new path, but things don't look the way they had after he finally gets his bearings. Will hurries toward a possible exit, crying out for Karen and Tom in the hope that someone has found the door open in the living room. The voice that eventually replies is that of a child. Davidson follows it down a long series of turns and dead ends, finally catching a glimpse of light from the living room. Daisy is standing in the doorway, guiding him home. He sprints into the living room and embraces her. She had a nightmare, she explains, and came to find Will, who wasn't in bed. Daisy's own encounter with darkness has saved her father's life. Will returns his daughter to her room, and in the process meets a remorseful Karen. She invites him back to bed, completely unaware of what's taken place. The next morning, a promise is made over breakfast. Navy is going to make calls and hand over the matter of the hallway. They would have Billy Reston come look, and then they'd call Major Media to break the story. And, finally, they would move. You know what it means to go crazy. That's why I took some time away from the Navidson record. I wanted to air out my head. Eating is supposed to be good for you, but I took a spell at the shop the other day. They haven't treated me the same since I fell. I haven't been the same either. So maybe that's just me feeling that way and everyone is acting the usual way. I write now more than I draw, which makes no sense for where I work. When I'm not writing, I'm looking for her. It's not every day, but Thumper does come by. I did something stupid the other night. Thought I was being heartfelt. I've been writing some things while I work. Video diary. Should be enough, right? It's where I dump all my feelings, all my thoughts. Karen and Will with their little secrets, and confessions and grudges and admissions. It's not. I write more than I record, and I don't know what's... I don't know what I'm going to do with it, if I do anything with it. But I wrote about Thumper, and it's everything I can't say, but I need to say. So I put it in an envelope, and I gave it to her at the shop. I tried hiding after. Couldn't hide far enough to get rid of myself because the storeroom's in the back. Thumper came by the desk before she left. She gave me her card and told me I'm cute. <laughs> I'm cute. I'm cute. She says I'm cute. <laughs> yeah. I called her. The number was for her beeper. I left my number. 
An hour passed, I grabbed a bottle. After that, I took another, no call. Went for a third bottle and picked up the manuscript instead. Shortest chapter so far. Cat and the dog in the house. Nobody really is paying attention to them until something happens, which is usually the case for everyone, right? They end up chasing each other through the living room and go straight down the hallway. Everyone panics, but the pets, they end up in the backyard instead. Hallway doesn't exist for animals, it only works on people. Made me think about all the times I've felt like an animal. I thought about animals in general. I remembered the cats that used to visit Zimpano's courtyard, and how Lude said they all ended up at the end. The moment he started dying, so did they, dead or disappeared. So I went to find them. No one was there. The old man isn't there. Cats are all gone. It's just dark now. I write more than I record now. I had to write it all down before I felt like I could say it out loud and record it. It's a good thing Johnny does write a lot down. If he didn't, we could never trust him to tell us the full story. We've witnessed his speeding train of thought before, but when we reach page 77, it's clear he's gotten worse. Johnny claims he knows what it means to go crazy, but does he really know what crazy looks like? Does he see what we've been seeing this whole time? Page 12, footnote 18. Karen tells Navy the heater is broken. Johnny's water heater breaks. Even he sees that's funny, so he adds the word water to the writing. Page 25, footnote 33. Johnny translates the German passage about feeling uncanny, that is to say, feeling not at home, right after the Navidson family comes back from Seattle and finds the first impossible hallway. Johnny experiences an attack in the hallway at the tattoo shop by something in the dark. Very sudden, very menacing dark, hiding some twitching, clawed creature inside. We experience for the first time Johnny's ability to compose winding run-on sentences, a rush of thoughts, emotions, and senses barely clinging to coherency as they speed by. Page 34, footnote 41. Johnny writes a footnote diary following analysis of Karen Green's bookshelf building activity, which we know is an attempt to take control of the situation in the house by seeking pleasure and ignoring the issue, rather than take Will Navidson's lead by confronting it. Johnny meets Amber, one of Zampano's assistants, goes home with her, does coke, gets drunk, has a three-way with Amber and her friend, and in the midst of it all, spirals into a long, winding, run-on sentence that rips him away and forces him to face the memory of his dead dad, flying high in the sky, once happy and alive, and the next moment thrown into a windshield and burned in the inferno of a truck sprawled out on the road. Pleasure could not keep away his pain, and bookshelves could not contain the horror of Karen's house. Page 48, footnote 62. Johnny is focused on Zampano's personal connection to the Navidson record, hinting at his loneliness through the chance of hearing one simple word, perhaps your word, flung down empty hallways long past midnight. While at the bar with Lude, he tries to put his thoughts into words, only for Lude to reject what he's saying. We watch as Johnny plummets down another spiral, riding the speeding train of run-on sentences overloaded with racing thoughts and memories of his scars, his father's scars, the potential nightmares that plagued his dad and led to the sleep-driven heart attack that set the path for his demise, and the wife and son that would eventually be left behind. Then he and Lude move on to a party where Johnny joins his friend in a bottle of Jack to obliterate his own cavities and graves. He fails, and inside, a long dark hallway continues to grow. Page 52, footnote 65. We cam off discussion of Echo, the mythical beauty, subject of longing and desire, and launch into Johnny writing about another one-night stand, Lucy, who reminded him of his object of longing and desire, Thumper, eventually giving way to a slightly more structured spiral about the feelings he has for her. She does that to me. Like I already said, drives me nuts. Page 69, footnote 77. Will Navidson escapes from the hallway courtesy of Daisy, who came looking for him because she had a nightmare. Johnny wakes up from an extremely good dream about Thumper, goes to work, does just fine until he ends up in the ink room, where the light goes out and he finds himself in darkness, in his own waking nightmare, attacked by something he's felt before while at work, and is left only with the echo of a nonsense phrase. Known some call is Air Am. And now, for what Johnny fails to mention on camera following Chapter 6 and the incident of the pets in the hallway. Page 76, footnote 82. Not getting a call from Thumper makes Johnny feel dead, and he envies the pets from the story. 
Another long, horrible spiral of thoughts, senses, and memories tears down the page, eating every line in open space, flooding out into the next one, even dragging into it a moment Johnny learned regarding one of Zampano's assistants, who claimed that while leaving his apartment, in the darkness of a stairway, she too caught sight of a shadow that was not a shadow, but was something coming towards her out of the darkness. And yes, he knew how that felt. And Johnny did go to the courtyard where Zampano used to walk around, but the cats that visited the old man were all gone. Something else has taken their place, he wrote. Something I am unable to see. Now, for the detail Johnny missed in Chapter 6 or purposely left out courtesy of Zampano. When Hillary, the grey-coated Siberian husky, appears at the end of the Navidson record, he is no longer a puppy. A couple of years have passed. Mallory, the tabby cat, vanishes completely, and no mention is made about what happened to him. His disappearance remains a mystery. Among all the references, quotes, footnotes, and winding bits of analysis, it becomes easy to dismiss Zampano's long passages about Echo as just more academic fluff. But now we see that even if it's not for explaining the Navidson record, Echoes are an integral component in House of Leaves. Zampano's discussion of Echo is the cipher key that allows us to really, truly see this book and all of the first layer of what it's doing. All this time, we've been learning a very valuable tool. Echo Location House of Leaves is an echo chamber, and the echoes seem to reverberate between the Navidson record and Johnny's world. What he experiences can be reflected in the action in some form whenever he writes a footnote diary, just as he experiences a change in the physical Navidson dollhouse when something happens to the house in the manuscript on Pelican Black. He may deny it all he likes, but he knows there's something at work here and readers of House of Leaves can recognize footnote diaries beyond this point that echo the action in startling ways. Page 87, footnote 98. Karen Green cheats on Will Navidson in the kitchen with a much younger man, Wax Hook, a member of the Holloway team. She then seems to compose herself and run away. Johnny meets Kiri, a woman whose boyfriend is out of town. She cheats on him with Johnny, then drops him off crying and expressing remorse. Page 149, footnote 196. Jen notices while he and Wax navigate the hallway that buttons are missing from his coat. They've just begun vanishing, along with Velcro straps and even parts of shoelaces. Johnny tells us all the buttons on his corduroy coat are gone, and he doesn't know why. Page 323, footnote 276. Bits of ash begin appearing on the Navidson record as if someone had tried to burn it, and Lewd comes over, leaving Johnny with a lighter. He considers finishing whatever job started during that chapter, burning the Navidson record, but refuses to give in. When it happens once, it can be called coincidence. When it happens twice, it can be called uncanny. When it happens three times, it's a pattern, and every pattern has a reason. This has happened to Johnny much more than three times, not just in the footnote diaries, but in the video recordings too. Even these uploads are a disturbing echo of the action of the Navidson record. High 8 video recordings of personal diaries, just like Karen and Will made. Johnny informs us the Navidson record never existed. These tapes were suspected to have never existed. But does it end here, the echoes and reflections? Not by a mile. The story of Echo and her power may be the secret language of House of Leaves, but we've only read a few words. There is a deeper root of the cipher key's power and importance to be found in the story, located precisely where you would expect to find it. Echo is in the Navidson record. Echo is in Johnny's world. Echo is even inside House of Leaves, the copy of the book itself that you own, informing every paragraph, chapter, and footnote. But how does the presence of Echo work here, and more importantly, why? How is it that Johnny is experiencing a constant flow of events that seem warped by Zampano's manuscript, and to what end? What purpose? Exploration of any dark corner of the Earth and its mysteries most often requires genuine explorers. Experienced, equipped, eager for the expedition. So it is that in Chapter 7, the Navidson record ushers in three new characters, Holloway Roberts, Jed Meter, and Wax Hook. Holloway is an associate of Billy Reston's, a professional hunter and explorer. Jed and Wax are his employees, though Jed and Wax would most likely prefer calling themselves teammates. All three men are explorers with proven experience, having faced mountains, caves, and other treacherous areas of terrain. This, though, has to be the weirdest, Wax later tells Navidson. Though it doesn't really need to be said, the team has never had to explore a house before. Preliminary exploration efforts are conducted by the Holloway team. 
The first is a test to see the terrain and better prepare for another investigation, and it involves a length of fishing line nearly two miles long. When they return, it's for two reasons. The length of fishing line ran out, and they also heard the sound, the growl in the darkness, echoing now from an area beyond the final room Navy found. The next day, they conduct exploration too, taking four spools of fishing line, flares, and markers. Samples are collected from the walls as they travel for lab study. During this trip, Navy, Tom, and Billy rest in the living room, the base of operation with radio contact to the Holloway team. Eight hours go by. Upon return, it's reported the growl was only heard once, but the shifting of walls Navidson had warned them about has occurred. In addition to the new, larger space found beyond Navidson's travel point, they have discovered something unexpected. A massive spiral staircase heading down. Jed tries to describe the staircase. It was enormous. We dropped a few flares down it, but never heard them hit bottom. I mean, in that place, it being so empty and cold and still and all, you really can hear a pin drop, but the darkness just swallowed the flares right up. The next step is clear. An exploration must be conducted tackling the stairs. This is the most grueling by far, not only for the Holloway team, but for the operations base of Davidson, Tom, and Reston, relying only on the radio and seeing just how strong its signal really is as the explorers descend. Early transmissions report it takes only 45 minutes now to reach the staircase. However, the team spends the next seven hours traveling down, and still the staircase continues. Jed confesses he experienced vertigo for the first time. Wax is exhausted, though puts on a display of confidence. Holloway simply says, It's impossible to photograph what we saw. The diameter of the staircase at their lowest point of exploration was over 500 feet. At the top, it had been only 200. The deeper they went, the greater it became, spiraling out as well as down. It took the Holloway team 11 hours to return. Now, knowing the length of their journey ahead, they prepare for exploration number four. Readers experiencing House of Leaves for the first time may find themselves baffled by the appearance of page 97. First, we have the strangest formatting so far in the writing. An SOS code at the start of the text, followed by paragraphs throughout the entire chapter broken up by dots. During an emergency, the most important thing is the most urgent thing, and we don't have time to mess around. Only time to run, so let's just get to the point. Holloway and his team go into the hall for exploration number four. Time as usual passes with radio communication flowing to the outpost in the living room. The radio calls then stop. The amount of time spent by Holloway's team goes up to seven nights. They had only prepared food and water for six days. They have spent a week inside the hallway and calls stopped days ago. On the morning of the eighth day, a knocking sound is heard from upstairs. Three quick taps, three slow, and then three quick. And it keeps repeating. The sound is coming from inside the wall. Holloway's team has lost radio contact, but they're sending a message. SOS. There is no time to waste and Will tells Karen off. It's three in the morning. We don't have time to get officials involved or a search party organized. We have to go now. I waited too long with Delio. I'm not going to do it again. Fears must be swallowed. It's time to step up. Tom doesn't like the hallway at all, but he brings the radio station inside along with Will and Reston, who will be going to rescue the Holloway team while Tom keeps radio contact at the halfway point, maintaining a line between Navy and Karen. Before the chapter ends, we receive this on page 102 regarding the outcome of the film after Navy's editing work. Davidson names this sequence SOS, which aside from referring to the distress signal sent by Holloway's team, also informs another aspect of the work. At the same time he was mapping out the personal and domestic tensions escalating in the house, Davidson was also editing the footage in accordance to a very specific cadence. Tasha K. Wheelston was the first to discover this carefully created structure. At first I thought I was seeing things, but after I watched SOS more carefully, I realized it was true. Davidson had not just filmed the distress call, he had literally incorporated it into the sequence. Observe how Davidson alienates between three shots with short durations and three shots with longer durations. Thus, while representing the emergency signal sent by Holloway's team, Davidson also uses the dissonance implicit in his homebound weight, the impatience, frustration, and increasing familial alienation to figuratively, and now literally, send out his own cry for help. 
Will Navidson edited the film during the SOS segment to reflect an SOS signal. He coded the duration of shots in the documentary itself. Zampano did exactly the same in this chapter. On page 97, where the chapter starts, you may also find a checkmark in the lower right-hand corner. This, too, is part of the SOS message. But like all things in House of Leaves, the answer or outcome segment of a piece often comes before the question, or as you may now begin to see, the echo is heard before you find its point of origin. If House of Leaves is a puzzle and Echo is the cipher, the SOS chapter is the point you find it used in a way that teaches you how it's fully applied. The unbearable likeness of being, the novel it came from, with Tomas and Teresa, meet Will Mavidson and Karen Green, a photojournalist with a cheating spouse, meets photojournalist with a cheating spouse. Zeus and Echo meet Pan and Echo, so why am I so mad? Why are you getting upset about it, Johnny? Same exact message. Different delivery method. SOS knocking inside the walls. SOS editing inside the film. SOS writing inside the chapter. So now, if we're finding the action of the Navidson record is being echoed by the format of the book itself, what do we do? Remember, if it happens once, it's a coincidence. If it happens twice, it's uncanny. If it happens three times, it's a pattern. In chapters 9 through 13 in House of Leaves, the pattern proves itself. Here is what Zampano says to open chapter 9. Having already discussed in chapter 5 how echoes serve as an effective means to evaluate physical, emotional, and thematic distances present in the Navidson record, it is now necessary to remark upon their descriptive limitations. In essence, echoes are confined to large spaces. However, in order to consider how distances within the Navidson house are radically distorted, we must address the more complex ideation of convolution, interference, confusion, and even decentric ideas of design and construction. In other words, the concept of a labyrinth. It would be fantastic if based on footage from the Navidson record, someone were able to reconstruct a bow plant for the house. Of course, this is an impossibility, not only due to the wall shifts, but also the film's constant destruction of continuity, frequent jump cuts prohibiting any sort of accurate map making. Consequently, in lieu of a schematic, the film offers instead a schismatic rendering of empty rooms, long hallways, and dead ends, perpetually promising but forever eluding the finality of an immutable layout. What proceeds throughout chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 is a tossing, turning hellscape of formatting that picks up where the SOS chapter left off. Action in the story is echoed in the text. Holloway's team survives three days and nights traveling the staircase. On the morning of day four, they reach the end and begin exploring immediately, painting the walls with neon markers to keep track of their movements. As part of exploration and his own need to find something in this place that's different from all the empty rooms, Holloway breaks a hole in one of the walls, effectively making the very first window in this world. On the other side, there's nothing but another blank empty room. On this very same page, number 119 in House of Leaves, we find something incredible. Holloway's window has punched its way into the book itself. Inside, we find footnote 144, describing everything Holloway would not have seen looking through it that he may have been hoping for in a giant maze designed like a house. This window keeps on going for 25 pages before hitting the end of the visible space, at which point it would hit a wall. On the 26th page on the opposite side of that space, we have a black square that is the same size as the window. That entire footnote was contained in a window we looked through using Holloway's own vision. It extended through the room and met the far wall, ending with blank space. On the opposite side of this page, this wall, what do we find? Pure black. We can't see here. It's the other side of the wall and outside the room we looked into using the window Holloway made. And as the team moves throughout the labyrinth in the chapter, they find endless confusion all around them. Detours, hallways, endless routes of nonsense, garbage, and distractions from their potential true path forward. Look at the way the text is formatted on these pages, especially the footnotes. It's nonsense. It's confusion. It's distraction and garbage. Now go back to what Zampano told us at the beginning. In order to consider how distances within the Navidson house are radically distorted, we must address the more complex ideation of convolution, interference, confusion, and even decentric ideas of design and construction. In other words, the concept of a labyrinth. 
If you stop at any moment in chapter 9 to look at the footnotes, one of many things can happen. You might find an endless array of ultimately meaningless writing as you will inside the window. You may find another exhausting list of meaningless names and credits spiraling up and down the sides of the page, which you're now caught in and believe might lead somewhere valuable if you keep going, all because you left the main path to examine a footnote, and again, you will hit a dead end. At other times, you'll look at a footnote and find it's pointing to another footnote, which you now have to find, and it will direct you into the middle of another different footnote in the future. Footnotes in the future will direct you back to the past, the beginning footnote marked X, and when we're led right back to the start of the chapter to see footnote X, we receive a translation of all three epigraph quotes. Here is the toil of that house and the inextricable wandering, the house difficult of exit, difficult to enter. Within chapter 9 alone, you can find at least four moments of being redirected to footnote X, sending you back to where you've already been. The footnotes in House of Leaves, often the greatest mystery catalyst in the book, can often be seen leading up to this point as annoying, pointless, and without reward unless Johnny Truen is writing them. Another dead end, another dead end, another detour, and all for what? Nothing. It led nowhere. A pointless, stupid wandering point with no reward. We left the main path hoping to find something and got nothing, and now when we keep looking, it just keeps leading us back to the start. Do you see the design of the puzzle box now? This is exactly the nature of the footnotes. All of the footnotes that Johnny and the editors did not write. The action in the story is reflecting in the text. The book itself is an echo of its content. The footnotes are detours and we keep getting circled around, running into dead ends. And when we follow Johnny, we know we're going somewhere that feels different. And we don't quite know where yet, but it's a path also loaded with echoes. And aside from the footnotes, the formatting of text itself reflects the action, at this point doing its best to confuse and scare us, making us hone in tight on Holloway and the team. Follow the path, stay with the group, ignore the side rooms and all the hallways and detours. Do not get lost. Do you see it now? Do you understand the full impact of the Echo Chapter? What is House of Leaves? You already know. It's not just this chapter. It's the entire novel. We've been inside the whole time. We've been walking around in it since page one. House of Leaves is more than just an echo chamber. It's a labyrinth. The entire novel is a maze designed with misdirection, confusion, redirection, dead ends, branching pathways that entice us and provide clues on the true way out, and filled all the while with a sense that there is something in here with us, hiding in the dark, lurking just out of sight. And Johnny Truant feels it too. Just as the action of the Navidson record is echoing out into his world, so it also echoes the sense of being haunted by something lurking in the darkness. Why do we build mazes? For what purpose? To lose someone? To guard something? To hide a treasure? To confuse? Why did Zampano build his maze? Did the Navison record build itself? Or is Echo's chamber really so powerful it releases the labyrinth into everything it touches? We're in the middle of it all now, and we know what surrounds us, but we don't know the matter of why. Echoes have been heard, but we don't know who made them or what caused the original sound. And in the midst of all this, stuck in the middle of a maze, confused, tired, and alone, we may find ourselves confronting a monster much bigger than we can handle. So what can we do? There's a saying some have shared before that, on first reaching one's ears, may seem sarcastic, but in practice and consideration, there is strength in it, and more so, there is truth. It's a saying my mother taught me. What do you do when you're going through hell? You keep going.